hey, didn't see you there, because YouTube law dictates that every video covering Banjo-Kazooie has to start like this. Banjo and Kazooie in Smash. Well, damn, to say about time would be underselling it. It's a pretty fascinating case, honestly, because conversations regarding the bear and bird duo can rarely happen nowadays without bringing up... Ha. <laughs> Rare. Banjo-Kazooie, what a damn good game, but you've heard this all endlessly by now. It was almost as if for a while, if you wanted to get into the whole video game review thing, a pretty cliche way to get your foot into the door would be to cover this game specifically. And... I would know. Listen, alright? I was a very different dude back then. Banjo's Smash reveal sparked something different in me. I wanted to finally experience everything that this franchise had to offer, from its debut to what led us to this very moment. And to do so, I was about to do something pretty drastic, and I did it. I bought an Xbox! Yeah, I'm actually part of the small percentage of the population out there who has never owned a single Xbox console. I've always been totally content with just Nintendo and PlayStation. But hey, I found an original Xbox One and Rare Replay combo for $100 on eBay. I've certainly spent money on much worse. Playing Banjo-Kazooie on the N64 is still fine and dandy, don't get me wrong, but I just had to see what I've been missing out on with the Xbox Live versions for all these years. It runs at a higher resolution, that's the big one. The life icon doesn't really look as good. I, I don't know man, That's that always irked me. All of the Nintendo references were removed and replaced, and uh, you know, that one, that one makes sense. Banjo does still rock a classic Game Boy on the load menu though, which is pretty cool. You know, it probably would have been a bit too much work to outright change the model with something else. And besides, the only equivalent device that would have made sense would have been to give Banjo a Zoom, and that makes me uncomfortable. And hey, can't forget about this, my very first ever achievements. How exciting. Uh -huh. Well, hot damn, that's $100 well spent. But oh, if it's Banjo's debut we're gonna talk about, Banjo-Kazooie isn't the game to go over, of course not. It's... Diddy Kong Racing! Often a forgotten part of Banjo's past, Diddy Kong Racing is actually the first sighting of the bear, just with no bird in sight. He was simply one of the playable racers and nothing more, so it's mostly just a neat little factoid. It was an appearance that lacked much impact. I'm Banjo! Whoa! But you slap a bird on him, you wait a year, compose and animate an iconic musical number to start off a brand new adventure, and well, the rest is history. So the plan here is to take a look at what made this game so good, and then take a look at the highs and lows that followed soon thereafter. People lost their minds seeing Banjo and Kazooie show up in Smash Brothers. Surely there has to be a reason why, and finding that reason out starts now. It's Banjo time! Straight out of the gate, Banjo-Kazooie just oozes charm. The load file screen is fantastic, which is a sentence that you don't really hear very often. Banjo just chilling out around his house, getting a bit of cooking done. The music is different when hovering over each file. It's minor, but it really does set the tone for the rest of the game. The story is super simplistic as well, but enough to get you out of the house and ready to go. The evil witch Gruntilda can't stand that her talking pot basically called her ugly. The prettiest in town is his little bear girl, Tootie, Banjo's sister, and in an absolute rage, she sets off to do something about it. Uh, any day now. Oh, okay, there, there she goes. Grunty then manages to kidnap Tootie, and Banjo somehow slept through the entire thing that was going on outside, despite Kazooie losing her mind right next to him. Man, he's a, he was hibernating just then. And once we get all of the info from our friendly neighborhood bottles, we set off on an adventure to save our sister. And we gotta get her back super soon or else Grunty will steal all of her prettiness. That's a damn impressive machine to be honest, props to her. Sure, it's a pretty nothing plot and at the end of the day you are still saving the girl, but it gets the job done, it has a good fairy tale vibe to it. And just like that, we're already at one of the coolest parts of the game. At this point, Bottles offers you the tutorial section, where you get to run around the awesome starting area, Spiral Mountain, and get used to the different mechanics available to you. And you're not allowed to move on until he gives you each individual move. 
or you can just press the B button, get everything immediately, and get going. The entire tutorial is optional. Being able to start properly playing the game almost immediately is really satisfying and something that modern games still sometimes have troubles with. You do still deal with tutorials from bottles introducing brand new moves to your arsenal throughout the different levels, but the banter back and forth is actually super endearing. Kazooie and Bottles call each other names on a constant basis while Banjo is the straight man and just wants to get things done. This makes the encounters a lot more enjoyable. Right in their very first ever interaction, Bottles calls Kazooie strange looking and she immediately hits him back with Goggle Boy. Oh man, how vicious. And then we have Grunty's Lair, found by entering her massive head sculpted onto a mountainside. I'm sensing a bit of a pattern here with these big head mountains in rare games. The layer is Banjo-Kazooie's hub world, and man, it is one of my favorites. There's a surprising amount of variety to the landscapes found within, and the further you progress, you notice that it's always slowly transitioning into the themes of the worlds that you're about to jump into, with new enemies and obstacles creeping in, and the layer's music remixing on a level-by-level -level basis. And the entire time, Gruntilda will regularly chime in with insults in rhyme form, just the right amount of annoying to make it compelling to take her down. Even her sister Brentilda is rooting for you as well. She pops up around the lair to help you out for your inevitable final battle. And uh, all right, all right, this part's not the best, but I'll, I'll get to that. And we've only just scratched the surface about what makes this game cool. The optional tutorials, the hub world, the loading screen. Yeah, Banjo-Kazooie does a lot of cool and unique things, but things like that, they kind of get overshadowed by the fantastic gameplay. All right, now let's talk about the fantastic gameplay. By modern standards of the word collectathon, Banjo is actually pretty by the books. Each of the game's nine worlds are laid out in a pretty similar fashion. Ten jigsaw pieces known as Jiggies, the main collectible, are spread throughout each and are rewarded for fulfilling requests by the world's NPCs or by completing gameplay challenges like finding the five hidden Jinjos. Oh wait, I'm sorry, I forgot the quotations. Hidden. Like literally, you're like... You're like literally a brisk walk away to safety. What are you, are, are, your, are your legs, are your legs broken? No. All right, sure, whatever. For the instant satisfaction of a cheery jingle, I'll do whatever's asked of me. You also gain access to a constantly growing moveset, adding a ton of versatility to the play control. Extra movement options like the Talon Trot, which is gonna be how you spend 95% of the game playing. New items like different types of shoes to traverse poisonous areas or move faster. Being able to fly or turn invincible thanks to finding these colored feathers. And new attacks like Kazooie being able to shoot eggs from her mouth and her... Oh... But even in this fairly standard gameplay style, something that we're already pretty used to seeing with games like Mario, Spyro, more modern attempts like A Hat in Time, Banjo still excels due to personality being at the forefront of everything you do without needing to sacrifice fun gameplay. Each of the levels has a very distinct theme, with characters and missions fitting them to a T, like a giant snowman and living Christmas tree lights on the verge of death in Freeze Easy Peak, to the dreary bubble gloop swamp being filled with appropriate swamp life, both evil and good. <laughs> There are so many moving parts too, you actually have an impact on these worlds and the lives of the characters that you interact with. For example, in Gobi's Valley, you save Gobi from imprisonment, who then goes to find some shade under this chunky tree, Trunker, and after just a, just a little bit more animal abuse, not, not, not too much, the water from Gobi's hump quenches the tree's thirst, and then he leaves to find safety in a later level, Click Clock Wood, where you abuse him just a, just a little bit more, man, Gobi, Gobi can't catch a break, but I gotta get these jigsaw pieces. Cheeto is a bit of an underappreciated character as well. Hidden deep within parts of the lair, you can find Grunty's old magic spell book, where he rewards you with some cheat codes that can double your limits for your eggs and feathers, which you then input inside of a sandcastle in Treasure Trove Cove. There's no, no simple menu here, you gotta slam Kazooie into the ground for each individual letter. Oh man, there's a, there's a lot of animal abuse in this game. It does take way longer than a menu just for the sake of being unique, but I still love it. There are even some hidden cheat codes that you can access by completing a secret puzzle minigame in Banjo's house that, uh... Oh, oh my. Ah, uh, yes, uh, finally, uh, washing machine Banjo, uh, brilliant, watch out world, here comes some freshly cleaned tidy whities 
and Mumbo Jumbo. Man, you can't forget about this guy. In most of the levels, you can find Mumbo in one of his huts, and if you collected enough of his Mumbo tokens, he's able to transform Banjo into a brand new form, with a unique set of abilities to complete a few more challenges. The thing is though, this doesn't happen in every level, and more times than not, they end up having multiple uses, so it ends up not feeling like a tacked on gimmick that you just expect to happen every single time you enter a new stage. And if anything, it just adds to the game's charm and world building. These are more than mere stages, they're living, breathing worlds with plenty to do and see, and the music gets this across too, because every area comes with a bright and cheery beat to accompany the colorful landscapes, but it's also a dynamic soundtrack since it changes slightly depending on where you're located, like a muffled sound when you're underwater or in a cave. The composer, Grant Kirkhope, is amazing, he made one of the best soundtracks of all time, etc, etc, I love him, moving on, we've heard this a million times already. And in terms of the level's designs, they're also tight and concentrated, making it a breeze to navigate and constantly get your hands on some collectibles. The more minor items, the 100 music notes, are sprinkled about the areas in such a way that if you're going for all of them, you're guaranteed to see every single thing a level has to offer. This is also where the Xbox version shines. You see, in the N64 version, the music notes that you collect are not permanent, meaning if you die at all, they go back to where they were and you gotta collect them all over again. AKA Rusty Bucket Bay, oh man, inside of the ship, I hate this section so much, you go back to zero and have to start it all over again, I hate it! The jigsaw pieces are a brilliant collectible as well because they're more than just a simple number used to unlock a new area, they're tangible objects that are used throughout Grunty's layer to fill out incomplete puzzles that reveal the next stage. That's a really cool use for them and I always like that more than Mario 64 being like, oh the stars have magic and you need just about that much magic and now go fight the turtle. They also do a little bit of a dance every time you get one and it's consistently like the greatest thing ever. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's a, that's a 10 out of 10 game right here. I guess if anything could be said as a negative here, it's maybe that the levels do feel a bit too self-contained at times. Like there are a few moments when elements of levels leak into the hub world or other levels, like some sections of the layer being accessible with Mumbo's transformations and the aforementioned animal abuse, but typically a level has its own identity that stays there and that's it. You're also able to knock out most of the levels in one go, only on the rarest of instances being asked to return after getting a new ability. Realistically, none of this stuff is that big of a deal, but go ahead and try to remember it anyway, because who oh boy, I'll be bringing this up again real soon. A lot of the best elements about this game aren't exclusive to Banjo-Kazooie, it's just that everything coming together in such a fantastic way is why Banjo-Kazooie is held to such a high standard. You know it never feels repetitive, the worlds are so full of personality and life, you're constantly encouraged to explore while also being correctly funneled down the correct pathways, it nails everything so damn well, I would argue, perfectly. There is that one propeller uh, jiggy that you go for in Rusty Bucket Bay. That one, that one really sucks. But you know, aside from that, the development team totally nailed their first full go at a 3D platformer. For all of the reasons stated above, that is why Banjo-Kazooie is such a damn fine game all of these years later. Which is all the more reason why the end of the game is very upsetting. Damn, the end of this game kinda, kinda sucks. I'm sorry. Once you're ready to tackle Gruntilda, it's time for the Furnace of Fun board game. Uh... It's a super cute and novel idea on paper, but it's the part of the game that I dread the most. Each spot on this board is a different style of challenge, which that alone is totally fine until you land on a grunty space and then everything gets ruined. When you land on one, you get asked a personal question regarding how Gruntilda lives her life. And you remember Brentilda? Well, she gives you the answers to these questions, and on every playthrough, those answers are random. So you either need to really pay attention and write those answers down, or just blindly guess. And if you die, well hey, just start it all over. That's... That's awesome. I love the idea, but those grunty spaces really ruin the entire thing. If I was able to skip this without doing some sort of speedrun exploit, that would make this so much more bearable. Ha. <laughs> bearable. It does at the very least wrap up in a great way though. Once you make it to the end, Grunty escapes up a stairway, 
2D is saved, we're treated to a mock credit sequence, again, more similarities, and we get a cute little vacation scene that also reminds Banjo that, hey, you big dumb idiot, you still didn't defeat Grunty, haha, -ha. and then you get to make your way to the final part of the layer. You get access to a few extra goodies if you collected enough music notes, and with the help of her Dingpot who totally betrayed her, we can finally confront Gruntilda in a pretty great boss fight. The key to a good final boss, in my opinion, is one that properly tests every single one of the skills that you've learned on the adventure leading up to it, and this absolutely does that. Oh. Ah. Uh -oh. For better or for worse. After some solid hits, it's time to summon the help of the Jinjos. Oh what, you didn't expect these cute little incompetent creatures to come together and form the almighty Jinjonator? Well of course, it's only the most logical conclusion. They beat the crap out of Grunty, knock her right off the roof of the lair, and she falls all the way down to Spiral Mountain, and she dies. Like literally, a giant rock falls on top of her and her assistant can't free her, and she's suffocating, she dies. She actually, she legitimately dies. Well, damn, that's pretty morbid. Aw, oh, man, would you look at those melons. Finally, after that grand battle, the day is saved. Banjo, Kazooie, and company can enjoy some rest and relaxation. And then Mumbo does something pretty neat. He shows off secrets from the levels that we've been visiting, but they end up tying into the sequel, Banjo-Tooie. This is where that mythical stop and swap idea comes into play, but I think I'll save that for next time. Actually though, in the Xbox version, they start mentioning nuts and bolts instead of Tui, and I, I, I don't know how to feel about that. Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts make Banjo-Kazooie look like a joke. Oops. A series of somewhat weak final moments can't make Banjo-Kazooie any less of a fantastic adventure that still, all of these years later, remains in the upper echelon of 3D platformers. It's not just a good game on the Nintendo 64, it's a collectathon that helped start the trend of collectathons being a thing. Everyone at the time wanted to copy what Banjo-Kazooie did so well. Everything came together beautifully to make an unforgettable game that, in my opinion, put the Red Plumber to shame back in the day. It does have somewhat of an interesting history as well. Rare Replay has this really cool behind the scenes look at Banjo-Kazooie's development on how it started off as an RPG for the Super Nintendo, and then it moved on to the N64, and then we got sort of a side-scrolling thing here that uses the bear that we know now, to eventually getting to see the game that became an ultimate classic. They also just straight up show the beta Jiggy Get animation. This short documentary is a really entertaining watch that comes highly recommended as well. And you know, now that I finally have access to Rare Replay, I can check out the rest of Rare's lineup. All of these years later, I've only played a couple of their games, but there's 30 in here. <laughs> it's it's quite, the, quite the varied lineup as well. Uh, okay, so the first one on this list is Attic Attack. Uh, it's an old computer game, I guess. Yeah, sure, why not? Let's just say that Rare had humble beginnings.